And so what you're going to get from me today is a straightforward presentation of fact about global warming. Each of these facts will be referenced. You will not find any references apart from to this rather ridiculous video on this sheet of paper, but you will in my presentation. It will appear in a kind of brownish yellow colour on every slide where I got that information from. So you will be able to check whether or not, A, I have fairly represented the source of the information, and B, whether I have made a fair selection of information to put in front of you. And I'm going to begin with an admission. And that admission is, do bring more to the front if you like, we've got some room here. Um, and I'm very sorry that we <coughs> have been, uh, well I'm very pleased that we've got rather more people here than we had expected. But what I'm going to do is to start by making an admission. And that is that there has been global warming for 300 years, and I'm going to show you the proof. This is a brief history <laughs> of global warming. And I'm very grateful to <laughs> Professor M. I. Hatt of the Indian Geological Survey, who has been advising me on the Himalayan glaciers, which he looks after, and he says they're all doing fine, by the way, uh, for this interesting result in climatological thermodynamics. And we also, on this side of the house, admit that there are real environmental problems, such as deforestation, for instance. <laughs> so, what I'm going to start by doing is talking about this Agenda 21 document and about some of the things that are being done in its name, here in New Zealand, in Australia, and in other countries of the world. And let's first of all look at the main points, which are either in the document itself, or have been argued for by advocates of the document, frequently enough to deserve a mention in this list. The idea is to put nature above man. Nowhere will you find any mention in Agenda 21 that man is part of nature too. <coughs> they want to build a world government in the name of saving the planet from environmental disaster, particularly caused by climate change. They want to nationalise or abolish <coughs> private property as being unsustainable. They want to ration the use of energy, particularly fossil fuels. They want to ration your right to move about freely. They want to ban all commercial farming, an interest to quite a lot of you here. They want to make sure that you do not breed livestock, because they are unsustainable. They want to make sure that you cannot spray any pesticides or herbicides. And they want to make sure you cannot irrigate, irrigate your crops. All of these are policies being implemented now in various parts of the world in the name of Agenda 21. They want to pen humans in settlement zones, or as I bluntly call them, concentration camps. And you may think, am I being extreme here? I'm going to show you evidence of these points. Likewise, they want to destroy families as unsustainable, and their chosen methods, of course, are baby butchering, as Senator John Madigan of Australia calls it, and also contraception, which in most of its modes of operation is also aborted patient. They want to cut the world population very substantially. <coughs> one billion is one of the figures they mentioned, and they want to ban religions also as unsustainable. Now, some of these points you will find in the Agenda 21 document. Most of them you won't, because the document itself is written in kind of UN gas board language, so that anyone who wants to take advantage of it can pretty much impose their own view upon it. And we're going to look at some of the views that are being imposed upon it. First of all, here is this gentleman, Harvey Ruby. Now, he is the vice chair of the International Committee for Local Environmental Initiatives, ICLI for short. This is now represented in most local authorities here in New Zealand, in most local authorities in Australia, in most local authorities in Britain. Now, an Agenda 21 document is supposed to be voluntary, but local authorities, via the agency of this organisation, ICLI, are introducing laws that, and overlays that make it compulsory. And you could lose, certainly in Australia, I don't think it's happened here yet, up to 80% of the value of your property if they zone it for biodiversity regulation. This is becoming a serious problem in many countries of the world now. And Harvey Rubin has this to say, that individual rights, such as, for instance, the right of property, 
must take a back seat to the collective. So here we are, we're back into old-fashioned Soviet line <laughs> communism. And here is the evidence that they're trying to establish a world government. This is a quotation from the Copenhagen Treaty Draft of the 15th of September 2009, shortly before the Copenhagen Climate Conference, at which it was expected that the world was going to ratify this, or at least signal its intention to ratify this. And it talks very clearly of a government, and it talks of a facilitative mechanism, which is UN speak for the government's ability to enforce its will over the elected governments of the world, and also a financial mechanism, which means an unlimited power of taxation over individual countries. They were going to impose, for instance, a 2% <coughs> tax on every financial transaction in the Western world, which would have brought all the financial markets crashing, because, of course, they, they operate by continuous in-and-out trading. 2% on each of those would bring the whole system, and it was designed to bring the whole system to a halt. Now, this is a, a recent presentation by Bill Gates, who says that the only way to stop the damage that he says is going to be done from CO2 <coughs> is to cut the world's population. His favourite figure is 1 billion, compared with 7 billion today. And I'm asking for volunteers to step forward and join the vaccination <coughs> programme by which he says he hopes to achieve this objective. I have actually watched the video. I couldn't believe this. And unless the video has, is one of those that's been tampered with, that is what he said. He said he wants a vaccination program to reduce the world's population to one billion. Ted Turner prefers a figure of 300,000, of which, no, 300 million, I'm sorry, of which no doubt he would wish to be one. <laughs> Likewise, uh, there are others, such as Gorbachev, who says he would like the population cut by nine tenths, leaving just 700 million on Earth. And he says that he would like to do this via uh, the anti-family policies of abortion and contraception. And here is some evidence for those who are trying to introduce concentration camps. Now this is a map which was a very influential map. It was produced by Agenda 21 advocates in the United States. And it shows areas in red where no human to go again. And in yellow, we go only on very rare occasions with a very expensive special permit obtained from the Politburo. The few areas that are not in red or yellow, oh, and by the way, if Al Gore is in the audience, the blue is the lakes. <laughs> the areas that are not uh, shown in red or yellow, those are mostly military camps, and a few of them are the human settlement zones, or concentration camps, in which the entire population of the United States will in future be concentrated. Now this map was shown to senators just hours before they were due to vote to ratify the UN's Biodiversity Treaty. On seeing this map and having its legend explained to them, they unexpectedly and decisively rejected that treaty, to which therefore the United States does not stand apart. And in South Australia, where I've just come from, the farmer whom I met had this said to him by a member of the Natural Resources Management Board of South Australia. We can prosecute you for shifting a rock. So this Agenda 21 program is being infiltrated quietly via the local authorities into your country. <coughs> and they are gradually tightening the noose, gradually putting in more and more laws and regulations with which you have to comply. Farmers are being told they can't use the water off their own land unless they pay for it. There's one farmer in this room who wanted to put a goldfish pond next to his house, and he had to bribe the local official with what was delicately called a resource permit, costing $1,200 to put in a tiny puddle with a few carp, costing $35. So the racketeering that is associated with this is also very painful. What he should have done, and I've told him this, is to fight it and not give in to it. But of course people find it easy to give in to it, because otherwise you have a hard because the bureaucrats are the ones with all the power. So if anyone tells you that Agenda 21 doesn't matter, doesn't apply to you, it's all a sinister plot got up by the right to try and discredit the environmental movement, well know that the, the document does exist, and know that in its name, whether with warrant from the document or not, 
both the UN and other agencies, all the way down to local authorities, are introducing measures to regulate the environment in a manner which stood back and looked at it objectively in the round, as the Chinese used to put it, you would regard as simply lunatic if it were not so cripplingly dangerous to the future economic development of the West. Now, the motive that they give for doing Agenda 21, the excuse, the row they've generated beneath which they're introducing Agenda 21 is, of course, the climate scam. And what I'm going to do is to start with a few illustrations of how science is not done. And the first of these is, I'm going to look through a few of Aristotle's fallacies. Now, a fallacy is a kind of category of bogus argument, so common that you give it its own name. And he listed a dozen of these as being the commonest fallacies or bogus categories of argument in human speech 2,350 years ago. And the first of these is, you have to do this in, in baby language because all of these fallacies are in effect intellectual baby talk. And every time you hear someone uttering them, you know that they are uneducated. Then what they say is, but there's a consensus. <laughs> there's consensus. The argument from Pettus, or the head count fallacy, the medieval school then gave all these fallacies Latin names, the argumentum ad populum, is a fallacious argument. Just because you're told a whole lot of people say they believe a thing to be true, doesn't mean there are a lot of people, still less that they say it, still less that they think it, still less that even if they are, they are thinking it, that it's true. The mere fact of a consensus, even if there is one, which on the vital questions in the climate there is not, tells you nothing about whether that proposition to which the consensus is said to adhere is true or false. Ah, but they say, it's a consensus of experts. X, an unknown quantity, spurt a drip under pressure. <laughs> Just because you're told experts agree a thing, doesn't mean they are experts, still less that they agree it, still less that even if they are agreeing it, they are acting in accordance with their expertise, rather than in, in accordance with a fact grant from the government to say something else. And even if they are acting within their expertise and not being bribed with fancy grants, they may simply be wrong. So the fact that experts say a thing is true tells you nothing at all in logic about whether it is true or false. Then they say, what about the cuddly polar bears? <laughs> polar bears are not cuddly. In fact, there are seven times as many of them now as there were in the 1940s, hardly, as you may think, the profile of a species at imminent threat of extinction. So that's the fallacy of inappropriate pity, the argumentum ad misericordia. And then they say, this, you will have heard this one, the New Zealand graft, the worst in 70 years, is all our fault. It's because of man-made global warming. Is there anybody here who believes that? <laughs> no, I'm glad to see there isn't. Mm. Oh, there is one who believes it. All right. Uh, we'll deal with you later, madam. <laughs> no, um, let's be fair and, and, and look at this in a little more detail. There is a very good reason why this cannot be true. Can anyone tell me what it is? All right, we'll come back to it when I provide the evidence that shows you it isn't true. <coughs> Yes, there's been a drought. It's broken in some parts now in the Northland. But it has been uh, just about the worst drought on record in 72 years in New Zealand. That is a fact, at least as far as I can tell from the records I've been able to get hold of. But whether it's caused by global warming, that's another matter altogether to which we shall return. And I'm putting it to you that this is the argument of false cause just because there has been some global warming caused by us, and then there's a drought. They're saying, well, therefore, uh, the one caused the other. And that's the particular subspecies of the argument from false cause, known as the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, the after, therefore, because fallacy. Just because one thing happened after another doesn't mean that the first caused the second. <coughs> then this is another one they like. Agree with us or face trial in front of the International Climate Court. Now you may think, that this is all a bit extreme, Moncton talking about an International Climate Court. This, of course, is the argument of force, the argument about Barcelona. Well, it's not, unfortunately, a joke. At the Durban Climate Conference two years ago, they wouldn't let me in, even though I was an accredited delegate. 
So I had to hire a plane and parachute in from 10,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get pictures of me jumping out of the plane with a huge grin on my face. As I've never done this before, incidentally, and I'm not sure I'm ever going to do it again. But <laughs> it was a very interesting experience. And as a result, they then couldn't really keep me out. So I got hold of the draft final <coughs> negotiating text, which was available freely to the press and to the accredited delegates such as me at the conference. There were 2,000 pressmen there, not one of whom reported any of the points that occurred in this final document. And so I did, and it became the most popular blog posting that day on the internet of 500,000 postings per day hosted by WordPress. Why were people so interested? Because I told them what the press should have told them, but because they're in the tank for all this rubbish, they didn't. And here are some of the policies that I got taken out of this document simply by publicising it. Within 24 hours, they had to drop half of the negotiating text. 150 out of 300 pages were torn up, including the policies here, which I had highlighted, that they were going to give rights of legal personality to Mother Earth, she was going to be able to sue, Western countries only, and perhaps Moncton as well as a special case, in a new international climate court. Hello, I'm Mother Earth. I've come to sue you. <laughs> they didn't say how Mother Earth was going to let herself be known, how she was going to say she wanted to sue, who was going to represent her, more importantly, who was going to pay their fees. None of this was there in the document. Just, we're going to give rights of legal personality to Mother Earth. Now you may think, this is just intellectual baby language. Will you be right? That's exactly what it is. And these are the things that these supposedly serious international <coughs> negotiating delegates put forward until I had them taken out simply by publicising them. The moment the world saw this, they just went <coughs> and backed off. And just as well that they did, because one of their proposals was to cut CO2 concentration by half, thereby killing most plant life and therefore all animal life on Earth. What a brilliant idea. <laughs> because these people know no science at all. They had just gone on outbidding each other to put forward more and more ludicrous proposals for cutting CO2 until they ended up cutting it by half. And nobody at any point had switched on their brain if they had one and said, hang on a moment, what will happen to life on Earth if we do that? Because carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, ladies and gentlemen. It is a naturally occurring trace gas. Would anyone like to tell me how much of it there was in the atmosphere in the Neo-Proterozoic era, 750 million years ago? Madam, you were around at the time. Can you remember? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was 30% CO2 in the atmosphere at that time. 30%. Would anyone like to tell me how much there is now in the atmosphere? Thank you very much. 0.04%. Take five merit points and see me afterwards. 0.04%. And it was 30% and the planet didn't fry. And so we've gone from 0.03% CO2, 0.03% in 1750, to 0.04% now. Isn't it terrifying? And it might go, if we carry on like this without stopping CO2 emissions, it might go to 0.07% by the end of the century. That's the central estimate of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for which I am an expert reviewer. 0.07%. Is this going to bring the world to an end? Well, I don't think so. But is climate science, so-called, straight? This is a big concern, because governments are betting the farm on the notion that the climate scientists are telling them the truth. What I'm going to show you is some very disturbing evidence that they're not telling you the truth, that evidence is being tampered with, that bogus techniques are being used, and that outright scientific fraud is being perpetrated. And the reason why this matters is that those who know it is being perpetrated, even if they are not part of it, are not doing anything at all to stop it. And so something is going on here which is actually very dangerous in a wider sense, morally speaking. We're going to look at this now. Here, for instance, was a paper published in 2006. And what it shows is that, as you can see, there was a fairly low level of hurricane and tropical cyclone activity around the world. It's, it's not tropical, it's just the hurricanes. Category 3, 4, and 5, 
uh, land falling hurricanes in the Atlantic, and then you get this huge increase here, which the paper said was because of global warming. Now, how might we check whether this was right? Anyone? We might look a little bit further back in the record. Shall we do that? That is what was published with the conclusion that this indicated a huge increase in uh, activity of hurricanes in the Atlantic. And that was the truth. <laughs> there was no basis for that paper at all, because that was the truth. And we'll look at the extent to which hurricane activity is increasing a bit later on. Here, for instance, is New Zealand getting at it. And your Climate Science Coalition here, trying to oppose some of this nonsense, actually took them to court for tampering with the evidence in this way. The green data there are what are called the raw or unadjusted data from the thermometers. You measure the thermometer figures, you write them down, you take their average at the end of the year all over New Zealand, and that gives you an annual figure for the mean temperature in New Zealand. There it is in green, and it does show an increase of a not particularly terrifying 0.3 Celsius per century. But after adjustment by newer, it's suddenly a great deal steeper, about 1 Celsius per century. How have they done this? Well, they couldn't alter the ones at this end of the record, nearest to us in time, because there are satellites watching now. So these terrestrial records measured with thermometers on Earth, they can't cheat and alter them anymore. So they altered them at the other end of the record. Did they suddenly have new evidence that showed that the weather was that much cooler than the record that was actually taken at the time with real thermometers said? Of course they didn't. They made it up. And, the, and here is the truth of it. There, if you rebase all these uh, figures to uh, a 30-year period, take the average of that period, you then get the individual years anomalies up and down on that line. There is no trend. And here again, you can see a paper now that analyzed this in 1993. And you can see that the blue results from the paper correspond quite closely to the green results from the raw or original data. And the red was what Neewa did to it. And here again, this is the environment department. You are paying good money to them to tell you that if you get drier weather, there will be less rainfall. If you get wetter weather, there will be more. <laughs> gosh. And in, yes, gosh. You're paying them, I'm not. And then there's the uh, temperatures in Australia. They've been at it there, too. And you see here, the actual trend of temperatures at what is now Darwin Airport since 1880 has been downwards. That's the raw data from the thermometers. And they've corrected them. Mm -hmm. This time with a rather interesting series of step changes in the middle of the graph. So as to make it look as though actually there's been a very rapid rate of warming. And this is in the United States. Since the 1920s in the United States, there has been a decline in surface temperatures over the United States on average. But that's not what they declare to the Global Historical Data Network, from which the official terrestrial temperature records are compiled. That's what they do declare. And look if I flash between the two you'll see that yet again, there's not much change at this end of the record where the point of the arrow is, because they can't tamper with that because we have accurate satellites measuring the temperature now. So once again, they've messed around with temperatures in the 1920s and 30s to make it look as though they were a great deal less then than they were measured to be at that time. So this is happening all over the world, and we'll ask why it is in a moment. Then, in a category of his own for bogus science, is Albert Arnold Gore. Here, for instance, is what he said in a radio interview in 2007. I believe it is appropriate to have an over-representation of factual presentations on just how dangerous it is. And if you don't like my Tennessee accent, it's not me imitating a Tennessee accent, it's me imitating Al Gore imitating a Tennessee accent. <laughs> Anyone who uses language like that mangles English in that way ought to be shot. <laughs> but please don't actually shoot him, because in Wagga Wagga, 20 months ago, when I said the same thing, the Greens reported me to the police for inciting my audience to murder. <laughs> so please don't do that. I had to write to the police and explain the context. And they very, very nearly arrested the Green irresponsible for wasting police time. But uh, this is how extreme, and uh, they're now desperate. They can see this falling around their ears. They are worried. And so you get some wonderful absurdities. I was in 
Tasmania just uh, a few weeks ago, giving a talk at the university. And a large number of scientists from the UN's climate panel came along. And I happened to mention how interesting it was that the leader of the Greens in Australia for, for many years had his office directly on the seafront at Hobart in Tasmania, just where the rising sea level would get him. <laughs> and I said, to be poetic just as if it did rise, and it did get him. And there was a Green at the back who said, oh, just one moment. He said, why do you always get everything wrong, Moncton? You've been thoroughly discredited, because I'll tell you what the truth is. The truth is that his office is on the first floor. <laughs> <laughs> and so then there is Al Gore's poster, publicity poster, for his mawkish sci-fi comedy horror movie which your children and grandchildren are made to watch here in New Zealand. And it's been discredited over and over again by no less than the High Court in Britain, which found nine serious errors. But let's just look at this poster. Can anyone tell me what is wrong with the temperature graph that's shown on there? <laughs> Part of it goes backwards. Yes, exactly. Time doesn't run backwards, Al, baby. <laughs> and this line wasn't drawn by a computer or a meteorologist or a climatologist. It was drawn by a PR person, just like the rest of the movie. And then he exaggerates sea level rise. Now, as an expert reviewer, I can tell you that the IPCC's view is that we might see 43 centimetres of sea level rise over this century. I think that's a huge exaggeration, but that's the official thing, of which only six centimetres will come from melting ice. But Al Gore knows better. Because if you can produce a figure bigger than that of the IPCC, as here, a hundred times bigger, that's all right, that's the consensus. If you're going to say, like me, well, we might see only five centimetres in total of sea level rise, perhaps 20 at most, and maybe it might even fall a little over this century, then you're going the other way, then you're not part of the consensus. But he can exaggerate a hundredfold, and that's part of the consensus. You see how silly this is. And he didn't even believe his own forecast, because... In the year he was making this movie, 2005, he spent $4 million on a condo in that tower, on the left there, at point A on the map. And the blue area, if Al Gore is in the audience, is the allegedly rising ocean. As he must have known, because the address of the building is Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco. <laughs> then he says, oh, polar bears. This is one of the great poster children for global warming, isn't it? Polar bear. Oh, the cuddly polar bear. Well... He cites only two scientific studies in his entire presentation. You'll see that I do rather better than that as we go through this. He cites only two. One of them is Moniton Gleason, 2006. And he says a scientific study shows for the first time that they found in polar bears that have drowned, swimming long distances, up to 60 miles to find the ass. <laughs> so what did the paper say? Shall we have a look? It said that four polar bears had been found drowned, Three of them right next door to the coastline, the other one a bit further out. Had they drowned because of global warming? The paper doesn't say that. It says that maybe one day, if the ice all melted away, they might have to swim a little bit further. But it said that hadn't happened yet. It said that these four polar bears drowned because they were swamped by high winds and high waves in a big storm. As we climatologists put it, shit happens. <laughs> Nothing whatever to do with global warming. And in fact... In the Beaufort Sea, if you were Beaufort Sea up there, in the Beaufort Sea, in the dozen years preceding the making of Al Gore's movie, there had been no decline in the extent of the sea ice that the polar bears wanted to clamber onto. It had gone up. So there was no point of contact with the truth anywhere in Gore's story. And the judge had quite a lot to say about that, as he did about the sea level point I showed you earlier in the High Court. He said, and I'll do it in the, in the custard-faced voice they all use in the High Court, the Armageddon scenario that he depicts is not based on any scientific view. <laughs> the Armageddon scenario he depicts is not based on any scientific view. And there was this picture, and this is accompanied by dreary music, and a, a, a voiceover saying that the polar bears were having this iceberg melting beneath them, and that was the last iceberg in that area of the ocean, and they would all drown, and the kids in the audience blub every time they see this. Yes, and your kids are being shown this. And what's the truth? The truth is that this picture, which occurs in, in the book of his movie, was actually taken by a passing tourist in a cruise ship 
hundreds of yards from the shore. There was no problem for the polar bears at all. What they were actually doing was basking in the sun, and as the ship passed by, they were judging the distance to the rail to see if they could jump across and have a couple of tourists for lunch. <laughs> so this is known as Ursus Bogus. Ursus is the Latin for bear, and Bogus is the Latin for bogus. Now then there's the Kilimanjaro era. That's another one that the judge was uh, very sharp about. Here you see two pictures of Kilimanjaro. There's more ice on the one at the top, 30 years previously, than the one on the bottom. How can we tell whether this was caused by global warming? Well, the first thing we would do is we would have a look at the te temperature as monitored by satellites continuously over that 30 year period, or I don't know, most of it anyway, to see whether the temperature in the region of the summit had gone up. Shall we do that? Here it is. No increase at all. And that zero line there is in fact at minus seven Celsius. So I'd like you to go home and do an experiment. <coughs> Take a block of ice, put it in your freezer compartment at minus seven Celsius, and come back in 500 years and tell me how you've got on and how much of it's melted. Because of course what had happened is the ice could not have melted because it was too cold up there. The maximum temperature that it ever reached in that period was minus 1.6 Celsius in the entire record. And you can't melt a mass of ice at minus 1.6 Celsius. So what's going on? Well, what's happening is that it actually was cooling in that region. There's been no such thing as global warming yet because Central Africa <coughs> has been cooling. And the cooling meant drying of the air so that the ice sublimated. It went straight from its solid icy phase to being a gas without going through liquid water on the way. It didn't melt, it sublimated because of the dryness of the atmosphere. So our baby, as are still waiting, I challenged you to a debate on international television six years ago. I haven't had a reply. You can run out, but you can't hide. I'm coming to get you. I'm now going to look at the main conclusions of all five of the UN's climate reports, these big uh, assessment reports of the IPCC, the UN's climate panel. And what we're going to notice is that each of these <coughs> principal conclusions, they've done five of these reports, the fifth one just about to come out, each of these conclusions is not just wrong, it's in your face wrong, it's deliberately wrong. They have been asked to put it right and they have refused to do so without being able to say that what they've done is correct. <clears throat> so we're looking at willful error here, and in one or two cases, plain scientific fraud. And I'm going to show you now each of these five. And the first one is the first assessment report of the new UN climate panel, which had been set up just two years previously. This was in 1990. And this was when they first began saying, we are the experts, we are the walrus. We know what we're talking about. You have to believe us. We are the consensus. Do not argue, because we're the scientists and you're not. And what they said was there was going to be a certain increase in global temperature between then and now. We've now been around long enough since that first assessment report, a whole generation, 23 years, has passed to see whether or not the consensus that we were told we had to believe in got it right or not. And that's what we're going to look at now. Because the UN made an enormous range of estimates, from a high viral middle to a low, which I'm going to portray in red, yellow, and green on the graph you're going to see. But in black will be the real world temperature change that's actually happened since then. And we'll see whether it falls nicely between the red and the green, as it should. Well, no, it doesn't. The consensus got it wrong. Even though we'd been told we simply had to believe it because it was a consensus. The consensus prodigiously exaggerated the amount of warming that should have happened. And it hasn't happened. It plainly, blindingly, obviously hasn't happened. They were wrong. 1995, the second assessment report. This is what the scientists had to say, 600 of them. They said, when will a man-made effect on global temperature be identified? It's not surprising that the answer to this question is we do not know. Now, what's wrong with that statement, ladies and gentlemen? The answer is there's nothing wrong with it. They are correctly expressing a genuine doubt as to what the future course of events is. Now, the IPCC was founded 
not to decide whether or not there was a threat from global warming, but to assume that there was, and then to proselytise for it. But they weren't willing to do that, because, ladies and gentlemen, we are not talking about the whole of climate science going wrong. We're talking about maybe a dozen bad scientists conspiring, and we know they've been conspiring because we've got the emails between them, thanks to the Climate Gate affair, to do bogus science. And we've got a whole lot of hangers-on, not just in science but elsewhere, because it was profitable or socially convenient, or if you were in academia and you dared to challenge any of this, you got into trouble or lost your job, or were downgraded. I've seen that happen to a lot of friends of mine. But nevertheless, it's only a small number of people who are actually driving this scare. Here is 600 good people, good climate scientists, saying we, don't, we can't see a human signal. We don't think there is one. And we can't even see that we're ever going to be able to see that there is one. That's honest. It's also scientifically correct. So why am I objecting to it? Why am I arguing with this? Well, the word before will give you the clue, because that is what was published. And it says the body of evidence now points to a discernible human influence on global climate. The body of evidence does, does not discern any such thing. Five times. The, the good 600 scientists said we can't find any human signal in it. They said it five times in that report. One man was brought in by the bureaucrats to rewrite it. One bad scientist, Dr. Ben Santa of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and he wrote that, contrary to the findings of the scientists. Did he refer it back to them? No, of course he didn't. A few of the lead authors who were in the know were told about it. The rest were kept in innocence until they suddenly saw when it was published that what they had concluded was not what was stated, but the precise opposite that there's now, so it was said, a discernible human inference on global climate. So if anybody tells you there's a consensus, then know this. First of all, the consensus got it wrong in the first assessment report, and this time the consensus simply was the consensus of just one man. That's no consensus. That is scientific fraud, ladies and gentlemen. The 2001 third assessment report had a problem, because today's temperatures aren't very exciting. It's been warm before, quite a bit warmer than the present before. Indeed, if you go back far enough, you go back 8,000 years to the Holocene climate optimum, caused, called an optimum because warmer weather is better. That was two or three Celsius warmer than it is today. Then we had the Egyptian Old Kingdom optimum followed by the Minoan optimum. Great civilizations come up every time you have an optimum. Then we had the Roman warm period. Then we had the medieval warm period, when the great cathedrals of Europe were built. And that was only a thousand years ago. And suddenly today's temperatures were actually less than the medieval warm period, as this chart from the 1990 first assessment report shows. Now, this is only a schematic. It doesn't actually have a scale of temperature on it. But it was intended to demonstrate that the medieval warm period was warmer than the present, the little ice age was cooler, and this insignificant little pimple here, that is not Al Gore, that is today's temperature. And it's not very exciting, because it's clear that what they were saying is that the medieval warm period was, was warmer. So what happened? Along came one of the IPCC scientists, Dr. Jonathan Over Overpeck, a bad scientist. And he wrote an email to a good scientist called Dr. David Deming, from whom I got the story. And he said, in 1995, he wrote him an email, and he said, we have to abolish the medieval warm period. <laughs> Not we have to check whether there was one or how big it was or where it was. No, we have to abolish it. And there was a problem with that, because, as you can see, it had already happened. <laughs> so what they did was they had to do some data tampering to pretend that it hadn't <coughs> happened. And this is how they did it. In 2001, in the third assessment report, this was the main conclusion. The UN was so pleased with this hockey stick graph, with the shank showing no temperature change up or down for a thousand years, and then this huge increase in the 20th century, that it made it its logo for two years until two Canadian scientists came along and dissected it and found the whole thing was both. So here's the, the exclamation mark, there's the medieval warm period, there it's gone. Then you look at the, uh, the blue bit there with Lyse and that's gone too. And look at the pimple. Look what's happened to that. They increased that by 50% by the simple expedient of using northern hemisphere temperatures only. 
which in the southern hemisphere there hadn't been much in the way of warming in the last hundred years. So these are the kind of dodges they got up to. And there were several other dodges. I don't have time in this presentation to show you. What I am going to do is to show you just one. It's such a lulu, I, I can't resist showing it to you. Here is Professor Phil Jones of the University of East Anglia, from which a whistleblower made these emails available in 2009. And what he is saying to the three authors of that graph, he's saying, I've just completed Mike's nature trick. Now, Mike is Michael Mann, the lead author of this graph, which was to appear in the 1998 and 1999 editions of Nature, the science magazine, and was then going to go as the star graph, used six times, large and in full color, in the 2001 third assessment report. And he says, I've just completed Mike's nature trick that he'd already used in the journal Nature, of adding in the real temperature to each series for the last 20 years, and from 1961 to to hide the decline. Now I'm going to show you what this is about. What it's about is this, that in order to reconstruct the temperatures before the red bit, the last 100 years, when we had thermometers, they had to find some way of doing it. There are lots of ways of doing it. The way they chose was to look at the widths of tree rings from bristlecone pines. That was their chief source of data. They did use other sources, but that was the main one. And they said that the rings would be thicker in warmer weather. And so you could uh, do a dendrochronology series, as it's said. You've got a series of overlapping tree ring uh, things as you slice through different trees of different ages, compile a series, and you can reconstruct the temperatures from it. That was the idea. The wider the tree rings, the warmer the weather. But the UN, in a previous report, had said, don't do it that way. Because with bristlecone pines, the tree rings will be wider. The annual growth of the tree that year will be wider, not only if it's warmer, but also if it's wetter, and also if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. It will distort the results. So don't use it. But of course, when the UN saw this wonderful graph, which was exactly what it wanted, uh, it said, oh, we won't argue about that. Oh, it's actually splendid. Oh, we'll, we'll put this six times in full colour. And they expect people to take them seriously. <laughs> so what they did to hide the fact that, you see, they had a problem. And that is that from 100 years ago until now, we've had thermometers measuring global temperature change, as well as the tree rings. And so, of course, if you wanted to use tree rings as a basis for saying that you've reconstructed today's temperature successfully, you would naturally want, wouldn't you, to check that during the period when the two records, the tree rings and the thermometer measured temperatures overlapped in the last 100 or 150 years, you'd want to make sure that they fitted. Because if they didn't, that would tell you that tree rings, particularly from bristlecone pines, are no use for reconstructing past temperatures, and therefore that that graph was completely bogus and useless. So they had to make sure that the two matched. And we're going to look and see whether they do. Here, the raw data, from three sets of tree rings, one from Keith Briffer, that's Keith who was talked about in this email here at the bottom, uh, one from, that's in green, and then you've got Jones from the University of East Anglia, he's the guy writing the email, uh, and that's in red, his, his data series from his little set of tree rings, and Mann, the lead author of this graph, and he's got a tree ring series of his own. Now they all come forward to the president, the first thing you see that from 1850 onwards, they're all jiggling about in different directions. You don't get a particularly good match to the actual temperature record, which starts in 1850 and is shown in black. But then when you get to about 1960 to 1980, you get so serious divergence between what the tree rings show and what the temperature thermometers show that this gave them a huge problem, in particular from Keith Briffer's graph, because at the right-hand end of where the green arrow is pointing, you can see that his green graph is plunging downwards while the black temperatures are plunging upwards, or rather soaring upwards. And this divergence clearly shows that uh, Briffer's tree ring series was not much caught. It also showed that the other two uh, simply stopped uh, rising when the global temperatures measured by thermometers carried on rising from the 1980s onwards. So these tree ring series were not reflecting correctly the changes in global temperature. And they had to hide the decline, in particular, in Briffer's thing. They had to hide it, because otherwise nobody would be willing to believe <laughs> the hockey stick graph when they published that in the 2001 report. So what they did, I'm going to show you now, you're not really going to believe this, but I am going to give you the reference so that you can go and check it. This was published by the World Meteorological Organization in 1999. 
it shows the same three data series as we were looking at before. If I flash between them, you can see that they are the, the same three data series. But look what's happened. You see where Briffers goes down to the green arrow there? Look where it goes now. Right up to where the actual temperatures <coughs> go. They simply truncated the data that didn't suit them and spliced on the real world temperatures to try to pretend that the tree rings were accurately reflecting what's been going on in the 20th century. And that, ladies and gentlemen, there is no other word for it but organised crime, serious fraud. That's what it is. And they're not going to get away with it. Because there's a group of us now that are compiling items like this, which you could put before any jury and ask them to vote on whether they thought that that was straight or whether it was fraud, given how much is resting on this. Governments imposing savage taxes, chiefly on working people, to enrich the already rich absolute bankers and people with windmill companies and governments themselves through taxation. The ordinary working man is having to pay for this, the farmer, the miner, the fisherman. There's a, there are serious consequences of tampering in this way. So now I'm going to uh, put this to the jury. You are the jury. I've presented the case. You've heard the case from the other side that this is all correct. <coughs> but here's the tampering that I've now demonstrated very clearly. I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to vote. Hands up those who think that that is serious fraud. <laughs> and hands up those who don't. I see no hands. That is a unanimous conviction, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I do this because... I'm so, you're a little bit late. You have to stay awake in these presentations. <laughs> um, and you, you're in contempt of court for being late. So, there you are. Of course it's fraud. Because they made a lot of money out of this. Michael Mann is still making a lot of money out of it. What's more, they cause losses to other people. You don't have to make any money for yourself or your mates in order for it to be a fraud. If you cause loss to other people, it's still a fraud. That's how the legal definition works. And that tampering, which is deliberate, willful, dishonest, that is fraud. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, I can now discharge the jury and continue with the rest of the presentation. Here you can see it more clearly, so there can be no doubt as to what I've been showing you. You can see all three of the different colours go all the way up to the top there if you look carefully. A complete distortion of the truth, which is over there on the left. And the next question is, was there a medieval warm period? Just because they tampered with things to try to suggest that there wasn't, doesn't mean that there was. So we have to look at the, uh, the actual climate science. And I sent in, as part of my review of the forthcoming fifth assessment report, which is still trying to pretend that the medieval warm period, if it existed, wasn't warmer than today. I've sent them a list of references, detailed references, to 450 papers in the scientific literature, compiled between them by 1,056 uh, scientists in 605 institutes in 44 countries, saying that the medieval warm period was real, was global, and was warmer than the present. That's what the science actually says. There are a few dozen papers, it is true, done chiefly by climate modellers, trying to pretend that there wasn't a medieval warm period, but they're all following methods as questionable as those of Mann, Bradley and Hughes in the hockey stick graph. So there was a medieval warm period. We know it from archaeology, we know it from history, we know it from the north window of Amiens Cathedral, where they show wine being grown in the region. You can't grow wine there now. We were growing wine uh, up in Scotland at that time. You can't do that now. We know that in, in one of the villages near Huelse, the main uh, Viking settlement in Greenland, there is a burial ground, but it's under permafrost today. It wasn't under permafrost when they were buried. We have all these archaeological indications. We have all the indications from these hundreds of papers. And yet, they say, with staggering arrogance, we're going to ignore the literature, which is our job to review, and superimpose a preordained or a prioristic opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's not science. Now we have the 2007 fourth assessment report. And this one is also truly remarkable. I'm rather pleased with it because I discovered this one. Now what we're going to do is to show you this. Who knows what it is? Sine wave. Sine wave. Thank you very much. Yeah. What is the trend of a sine wave? Just like no trend. No trend. Thank you very much. Quite right. A zero trend. <coughs> Five merit points again. Quite right. <laughs> no trend. But if we just take this down, up, down segment of it here, if I choose my starting and ending points 
carefully for my trend line. There's a downtrend. So, was the honourable gentleman at the front here wrong? No, because the trend of a side wave is zero by definition. There is no argument about it that's at all possible. And yet, we have a downtrend because I've chosen where to start and end my trend line so as not to reflect the true position. I can do it again. And look, if I start a bit nearer to what we might call the present, I've got an even steeper downtrend and steeper still and steeper still. And that's bogus because I'm choosing where I start and end my trend lines and then I can draw all sorts of conclusions. And in this case, it's not just descending, but ever more rapidly descending. That, of course, must be rubbish because we know that the trend is zero. But this is what you can do. Tamper, tamper, tamper and tamper. And then if I shift the whole sine wave half a cycle to the left or right. Each of these trend lines is correctly calculated. They're all correctly calculated, but you can't draw the conclusion from them that we are being invited to draw. You shift it all, half a cycle left or right, and look, we've got the opposite result now, because I've chosen different start points and end points in relation to the side wave, and now we've got it rising ever more rapidly. So not only do we know it's a zero trend, reason one why this is a bogus technique, but we also can obtain opposite results by choosing very carefully where to start and end our trend lines. Reason two, why this is a bogus technique. Now you say, what's it got to do with the climate? Well, this is what we mathematicians call a heuristic. It's an example from an area where we know a great deal about the data. We know that it's a zero trend. That's why we take the sine wave. And what we're going to do is to see what they do with this technique. Because there is a temperature record since 1850, a global temperature record compiled by the Hadley Center. It's regarded by the UN's climate panel as the gold standard for temperature measurement. As we've seen, it depends on some highly questionable submissions from New Zealand, from Australia, from the United States and other countries, but nevertheless, it's the official record. And I'm going to show it to you in grey, but you're going to see what they've done with it. Look, they even used the same colours I had, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. They have used the same bogus technique to try to say, and they say this twice in the report, the 2007 fourth assessment report, they say that the rate of increase in global warming is accelerating. Global warming is, is accelerating ever faster. And we are to blame. And they draw that conclusion from these trend lines, the yellow one being steeper than all the others and being nearer to the present than all the others. And they've used that bogus technique. Now I thought, but this is science. I, I don't expect the several thousand scientists who contributed this, to this report to allow this abortion into the document. So I went back, being an expert reviewer, and had a look at the first draft. I wasn't an expert reviewer at the time, or I would have shouted blue murder at this. But it wasn't there when the expert reviewers looked at it, because this was what the scientists had submitted. They'd submitted the entire record. The yellow areas, either side of the blue line, are the uncertainty bars, the, the error bars, because we, we can't measure with great certainty. It gets a little bit better towards the the present, but obviously there are, there are uncertainties in the measurement. So this, this is correctly shown, and they've got a single trend line there, which shows that there's been uh, warming over the entire period of 155 years at a rate equivalent to 0.4 Celsius per century. Not exactly terrifying. Not terrifying enough. Because once again, the bureaucrats got one scientist, and I think he was a New Zealand scientist. We are slowly encircling him, and eventually the police will be feeling his collar. And He's one of the lead authors of the, of the thing. And uh, he did this to it. And that, again, is scientific fraud. That is a very influential scientific fraud, because it's that scientific fraud that is being used at the moment in the United States to justify the bill to introduce a carbon tax. Because the Senate is being told by those moving the bill that the rate of global warming <coughs> is accelerating, and we are to blame. And this is the basis on which they're saying it. But this graph has also been influential in the other direction. Because I showed this graph without even the explanation I've given you when I was giving testimony in front of the Ways and Means Committee of the uh, US House of Representatives, the most influential of all the committees of the House. Indeed, of all the committees of either House, because it's the one that controls the purse strings. And the Republicans said that they wanted me to give a five minute presentation to the whole committee but they wanted to be given a presentation to themselves privately first. I put up this graph and told them what it meant. And John Linder, who was the Republican ranking member 
on that committee. At that time, it was under the control of the Democrats. He looked at it. He looked at the rest of the room, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen all that we need to see about whether or not we can place any reliance whatsoever upon the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or any of its works. And that was the moment at which the Republicans, which who had previously been very iffy, they'd said, well, we are going to fight this on the economics, we're not going to touch the science, it's too different. John Linder took one look at that and he said, no, nope, from now on the Republicans will fight this because it's clear that the science is being bent. That was his word, bent. And that's what it is. It's fraud. And that's why the Republicans changed their minds on this and are one of the few major parties around the world that have disengaged themselves from belief in any of this climate <coughs> rubbish at all. And that's why Obama didn't get his cap and trade bill through and that's why he's not going to get his carbon tax bill through because they're still trying to rely on this bogus graph but the Republicans already know that it's bogus. So that's what these scientists submitted. And let me make this point again. I am not at odds with climate science. I am at odds with the few bent scientists who have discredited their profession and discredited the name of science itself in order to make themselves rich and fat at the expense of the pennies of working people trying to pay to put fuel in their cars and keep their homes heated and cooled. It is disgraceful. And I thought, well, since they've supplied this graph, I'm going to put my friend lines on it and I'm going to show you what's really happening. And look, from 1905 to 1945, the rate of increase in temperature was twice as great as it was from 1905 to 2005. So there has been no uh, acceleration in global warming. In fact, the rate has halved. Now we're going to do science the way the UN's climate panel does science. We're going to take a vote. We're not going to take a measurement. We're going to take a vote. So hands up, ladies and gentlemen, all those who think that the United Nations uh, panel on climate change was correct in using this technique as its sole justification for saying that the rate of global warming had accelerated and that we are to blame. Hands up. Anyone who thinks that it's right. There's always one. Thank you, sir. And we'll come back to you in a moment. All those who think it is not right to do that. Once again, the jury has, has voted. Now let me reveal to you what I kept back, just in case anyone, having seen this very detailed explanation, which can leave you in no doubt as to the fact that that technique is bogus. Not if you're honest. I anonymized the data. That means I went to get the original data from the Hadley Center. I simply represented it as a string of numbers that they gave me. I took off the headers saying where it came from. I took off anything saying it was to do with temperature. Just a series of numbers. And I sent it to the professor of statistics at Cambridge. And this is what he said. David Siegenthaler. He said, uh, he said, I can guess what this is, knowing you. <laughs> and he said, it is more than my job is worth to give you a straight answer to your question, so I declined to do it. Wow. Even the professor of statistics at Cambridge, ladies and gentlemen, is running scared of these animals and what they've done to science. However, I went to another professor of statistics who wasn't so scared. He prefers not to be named, though. <laughs> and I said to him, here is this data. He's, he didn't ask where it came from. He didn't guess where it came from. He just did the analysis. I said, what I want you to do is to calculate the trend lines for these four uh, groups of data. I didn't tell him it was years. He didn't even know that. And I want to draw the conclusion. I said that because this trend line is steeper than the previous ones, then the rate of increase in the data is itself accelerating. I said, may I draw that conclusion? He said, what are you on? I want some. Of course you can't. There is no scientific basis for any such conclusion. So I'm sorry, sir, but you see, if you go to any statistician and just ask the honest question, that's the answer you will get. And it's no good trying to stick up your hand when you've been shown as detailed an explanation as I've shown to try and pretend that this bogus graph is genuine when it is plainly bogus. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Now, hands up all those who think I'm right. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, hands up. There's always a few. I have just explained to you that this is a bogus technique. 
And if I therefore choose my starting and ending point and try to draw a bogus conclusion from it, that conclusion too is just as bogus as the one that they drew. And the only reason I show it to you is to catch you out. No, the only reason I show it to you is to demonstrate that even with this data, you can uh, use this technique and get opposite results. You get any result you want by playing with this technique. And now, I was showing this in Tasmania too. There were a number of scientists there. And one of them said, oh no. He said, uh, that technique is perfectly all right. I said, I'm sorry, it isn't. Just get over it. This is as bogus as the other one. These are opposite results from the same technique. You can't do that. Here, and I'm no longer fooling you now, we're now back to doing this straight, which is how I try to do my exercise. What we've got here is three parallel trend lines. That means that the rate of warming in each of those three periods was the same. This third period here, more or less coincident with the yellow graph we saw here, you see, more or less the same. And what their graph concealed, and this is another reason why it, we know their graph is bogus, is that there were two previous periods in the record when you had warming at the same rate. And actually terrifying, one sixth of a Celsius per decade. That's the maximum rate of warming sustained for more than a decade in the entire 155-year record. I cherry-picked these three because that's what I wanted to see. What's the fastest rate of warming I can find? 